I'm going to play something right now, and I just want us to listen and see what we hear. Does that sound like anything to you? Okay, I'm going to play it again one more time. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. And now suddenly it's very clear. I know exactly what it is. Okay, now let's go back and listen to that original recording, the one that sounded unintelligible before. Does it still sound unintelligible? Do you now hear the words? So this is interesting because it means what we hear is not just what's in the stream of sound. What we hear is strongly influenced by what we expect to hear. Now that you've heard that with those words, you can't unhear it. So we're going to look at auditory perception through the lens of language. We're going to look at how we extract meaning from sound. Human speech is transmitted via sound, like what I'm doing right now. I'm transmitting my thoughts via sound. But sound is noisy and messy and complicated. So how do we untangle that mess? How do we make sense out of speech? What we'll see is that our minds are making use of many, many different kinds of information to reconstruct what we think we're hearing. We are not passive observers in the world. We are constructing our reality inside our minds. And we are constructing it according to what we know about the world and what we expect to be true. Speech is generated by precise muscle movements in the mouth, tongue, lips, throat, vocal cords, nasal cavity, all working simultaneously, coming into close contact with one another. By manipulating those muscles in our oral tract, we can change the shape of the resonating chamber that the air is traveling through. We can lower and raise our vocal cords. We can open our nasal passages. That dramatically changes the properties of that resonating chamber. And that generates very different kinds of sounds. So through that manipulation, all those points of contact, that is what generates all the speech sounds that all human languages contain. At the physical level, speech is a sound wave. It's a series of air compressions consisting of bursts, vibration, and aperiodic noise, things like um, hissing static. The periodic waves can be decomposed into frequency bands. Those are called formants. And those are what gives most sounds their identity. There are also timing delays. So there are offsets between overlapping periodic waves and noise bursts. Uh, and that also contributes to the identity of speech sounds. In English, that's how we tell the difference between a T and a D, T and D. It's based on timing delays. And all of these things are continuous. They each exist on a spectrum and they can take on infinitely many values. So that represents a new problem. Languages don't contain infinite speech sounds. All of this continuous sound ultimately has to map to a small set of discrete categories, things like P or T or K. So we need a way to map continuous physical signal to discrete categories. Let's distinguish two things. I want to draw a big line between physical descriptions of speech sounds and mental descriptions of speech sounds. So let's think about a couple words. Pet, cap, and spy. What do these words have in common? Well, they all contain a P, right? We write them with the same letter, but remember the letter isn't what counts. What counts is the sound. But I think we probably all will share an intuition that they all have a similar sound, P, some kind of P sound. But the P sound in each of these words is actually pronounced a little bit differently. Turns out all these P's are actually quite different in a physical sense. But I want to also think about sounds not just as physical entities, not just as turbulence in the airstream. I want to also think about sounds as cognitive categories. So I want to think about sounds in two different ways. We want to think about sounds both in physical terms as physically real things in the world, the way things sound in the wild, like when they come out of your mouth. 
It'll be some kind of um, perturbation of the airwaves. That's what we refer to when we're talking about physical descriptions of sounds. And linguists call those descriptions phones. A phone is a physically real thing. It's a description of a sound as it exists in the real world. And we want to distinguish that from a mental description of a speech sound. Something that is psychologically real. Something that forms some kind of category. It represents an atomic unit that we can use to build words. It's linguistically meaningful. Linguists refer to these as phonemes. And they're sometimes thought of as the smallest meaningful unit. Not the smallest unit of meaning, right? A P by itself doesn't have any meaning. If I just said P, um, no one knows what that means. It doesn't mean anything. It's too small of a unit. But it is the smallest atomic unit that you can use to build a word. And if you take a word like pet, and you take that P away, and you swap in something else, like a B, it becomes a completely different word with a completely different meaning. Pet does not have the same meaning as bet. So that tells us that this atomic unit is an extremely meaningful unit. It doesn't have a meaning of its own, but it contributes to the meaning in a really important way. So we can describe sounds at a physical level, we can describe sounds at a mental level, and there must be some way of mapping between these two things. Of course, every sound has to ultimately be physical in the real world, but we have to somehow take all of those sounds and all the little variation and we have to map that to our mental categories. The fact that all of these sounds are continuous, all of the features that we use to identify sounds are continuous, means that we can form continua. We can make spectra, morphing one sound into another very gradually. So I'm going to play a series of sounds on a spectrum from D to T. And I want you to think if there is a point where it switches over, where you can hear a change, from D to T. So what do you think? Did you hear a definite switch? Most of us are going to hear some point somewhere in the middle where it very distinctly changes from sounding like a D to very distinctly sounding like a T. Even though it's continuous and it's a spectrum that spans a broad range, for some reason we still perceive it in a very categorical way. We don't perceive a nice continuous transition. Most of us are going to perceive this as being sounding like it belongs to one of two categories. And we're going to hear a nice steep drop off, a nice line between the two. So that's kind of interesting, even though we know that the thing is continuous, in the real world, the physical description of these sounds is that they form a continuum. We don't seem to perceive it that way. Our brains don't treat it that way. We represent them as discrete categories. And humans are not alone in this ability. This is not a uniquely human ability. It might be surprising to learn that actually chinchillas can also do this. They also perceive these sounds in this way. Patricia Cool and James Miller trained chinchillas to cross their cage when they heard ta or da. And after training, they would play stimuli from that continuum, that continuum of sounds between D and T. And they would record how often chinchillas would cross the cage in response to those various sounds. What we want to know is whether the chinchillas are going to create mental representations of those speech sounds that will reflect their continuous nature, or whether they will, like us, mentally represent them as belonging to two discrete categories. So if we look at the results of this, what we see is we see a curve that looks like an S. If the sound was very definitely a T, then of course the chinchillas are definitely going to cross. And if it was very definitely a D, then they would also be very sure about where they should go. But the real question is what happens to all those other values, the not so extreme values? And what we see is that the chinchillas are not treating those values as indeterminate or fuzzy. They're taking everything that's on the T side of the spectrum, everything from the middle to the T, and they're treating all of those like T. And they're taking everything from the middle to D, and they're treating all of those like D. They're treating the whole spectrum as though it neatly divides into two discrete categories. That's why we call this categorical perception. And this is exactly how human beings perceive these sounds.
it gets really wacky if you actually look at the data and you see they actually compared the chinchilla responses to human responses and they are identical. It's so weird. It's so wacky. They are identical. So this is not a unique thing about our auditory system. It's maybe something that we share with possibly all mammals. And there may even be a very simple algorithm that governs this behavior. Of course, if you take two exemplars, one being the absolute D and the other being the absolute T, and you use those as your anchor points, well, there's a very simple algorithm that can sort all of the sounds from the spectrum into those two categories. Just ask, how far away is the sound I'm hearing now from the absolute T or the absolute D? Which one is it closer to? And on that basis, I can just decide whether it's a T or a D, or if I'm a chinchilla, I can decide whether I should go to one side of the cage or the other, just based on that raw distance, which is greater, which is, is it closer to this side or this side? It's a very, very simple algorithm. So this may be explainable by a very simple mechanism that we share with lots and lots of other animals. Where this gets kind of fun is when we realize that the mapping is not one-to-one. -one. It's actually very wacky. There's not a one-to-one -one mapping between physical sounds and mental representations. Here I have a recording of someone saying the words pin, spin, and bin. Pin, spin, bin. Now, some of these words contain a P, and at least one of them contains a B, right? Pin has a P, spin has a P, and bin has a B. I think that we would all agree with that. And that's definitely true in a mental level. When we describe the sounds in these words, if we describe the mental categories, pin will have a P, spin will have a P, and bin will have a B. But there's something a little bit different happening at the physical level. At the physical level, the P in pin is actually very, very different than the P in spin. And we can demonstrate this if we take that S and we remove it from spin. Now what does it sound like? Bin. 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 It definitely doesn't sound like pin, right? Really, it sounds like bin. That's kind of crazy. It actually sounds almost identical to a B. And you can see the real proof of this if we take that S and then we just paste it right in front of bin. Remember that this is bin, right? Bin, bin, bin. If we splice in that S here. Spin, spin, spin. It sounds like a perfectly valid spin. So what is going on here? We have a P in pin. I thought that we had a P in spin, but actually it turns out it sounds identical to the B in bin. And when we put that S in front of bin, it sounds exactly like spin. Well, one way we can break this down is we can say at the mental level, in terms of the mental categories, the phonemes, yes, pin and spin both have P's. That's sort of how we think of them. That's our cognitive perception of those words. But in terms of the physical reality, the phones, well, in that case, the P in pin is very, very different than the P in spin. The P in spin actually is almost identical to the B in bin. This gives us a very funny kind of mapping where spin and bin map to the same physical sound, but they map to different mental categories. And pin and spin map to the same mental category, but they map to different physical categories. So there's not a clean one-to-one -one relationship between the mental and the physical levels. And it's not a one-to-many relationship or a many-to-one relationship. It's very messy. It's a many-to-many -many relationship. It's really kind of wacky. So context is actually extremely important for identifying sounds. And this is some of the best evidence we have for phonemes as mental categories. The mental representations are not equivalent to the physical sounds. We need to be able to describe them at two different levels. We need to be able to describe them in two different ways, both as physical phenomena in the real world and as mental representations, categories that are useful to us for language that we store in our minds. I'm gonna shift tracks a little bit. We're gonna talk about how we make sense out of the things that we hear 
by using clues from context to reconstruct what we think we're hearing. So far we've been talking about how do we map those raw acoustic physical sounds to our mental categories. And we can think of that as a type of bottom-up processing. We are taking the raw sounds from our sensory organs, right? We're taking the, whatever our ears are hearing, that information, using that to build it up into some kind of mental representation. Say, okay, well, am I closer to like the D or am I closer to the T? Really simple algorithm to build up a representation of a sound from the ground up, right? From the senses upward. But it turns out that we also do a lot of processing top down. We use what we know about the world and we use all of those contextual clues to try to fill in the gaps and maybe change what we think we heard based on what we think it probably should have been. So when we go in the bottom up direction, we might ask, well, what am I hearing? What is the raw input coming in through my senses? But we can also tackle it from the top down. Is this something I've heard before? What am I expecting to hear in this context? So we'll start at the lowest level. We'll talk about co-articulation. Well, what is co-articulation? Well, remember that we're producing sounds by moving all those muscles in our oral and nasal tract, right? We got our larynx, our vocal cords, our tongue, lips, interacting with our teeth, interacting with the roof of our mouth, all of these things coming in contact with each other. And so every time we make a sound, we actually have to move muscles into some kind of contact with each other. There are different sequences of muscle movements for different sounds. So if I'm, my tongue is currently in position to do something like a k, like a k, it's not really in a very good position to make a sound like an e. The tongue has to be in two different places for those two different sounds. That becomes an issue if the two sounds are right next to each other in the word. If I want to do k and then an e right next to each other, well, I got to do a really fast tongue movement to get in position. So there's going to be a little bit of lag and there's going to be a little bit of a blur between one sound and another. It's not so clean. There's not a clean di division from one sound to the next. My tongue is like this for a K and then it's got to be like that for an E. And so that's going to affect the way that the K sounds. And you can try this yourself. Maybe you can actually hear it. Just repeat ki 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 ku 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 ki ku ki ku and you might hear or even feel kind of a difference with a K. Ki, ka, ko, ku. It's going to sound a little bit different based on what your tongue is going to have to do next. And so this also works when we talk about perception, right? When we're perceiving speech, we have to sort of take this into account. We know that this is true, that when people are producing sounds, their tongue has to move to different parts of their mouth really quickly. And there's going to be a blurring between one position and another. They're going to sort of like blend together. So we have to somehow account for that and reconstruct accurately the sounds that they were intending to produce. So that information, the information about what sound is following what other sound, that can sort of help us prepare for what we think the next sound is going to sound like. Once we know that these sounds affect how the next one is going to sound. Let's see this in action. Here's two different spectrograms. On the left we have shu, and on the right we have su. Okay, so what? Well, if you see on the left side that big smear, that's the shh. And then the same for the spectrogram on the right. We have another smear for the S. That's what an S and an S look like. They look like just kind of a big smear of noise. You might notice that the smear for the S is a lot longer. It goes down a lot lower. Well, that has an interesting side effect on the vowel that follows. In the vowel that follows, you can see those they're distinct formants, right? You see there's four distinct formants there. Well, with shu, because that smear of noise goes so far down, it's actually pushing the vowel formants down. It's affecting the way the vowel sounds. It's compressing the space that the vowel occupies in terms of that physical acoustic space. So it pretty dramatically changes the way the vowel sounds. So when you hear that esh or s, you can sort of mentally prepare for how you think the next vowel is going to sound because you know it's going to be a little bit different because of the sound that it's following. Okay, well sounds can also be affected by the sounds that come after them, like the example with k, ki versus ko versus ku. So we actually have to use that information to figure out what sound we heard previously. The context in that case is working backwards.
Here's another example. This is another example of a vowel being changed by the consonant that follows it. So again, we're looking at those formants, right? Those bands of noise. And you can see with pup, you get those nice parallel lines. Pup. But when we look at put, suddenly the lines aren't quite so parallel anymore. That second formant is now going upward and we get a, that sort of alligator mouth shape. Why is that? It has to do with co-articulation, right? Pup, the P in pup, is a labial sound. We just use our lips. It actually doesn't involve our tongue at all. So our tongue has total freedom in this case to articulate that vowel exactly the way that it wants to. It doesn't have to get ready for anything else because the next sound is one that only uses the lips. It doesn't use the tongue at all. But put, the T in put, does use our tongue. And now there's an issue because the vowel is no longer so free to express itself. Your tongue has to get ready for that following consonant. It has to start moving. And so the vowel doesn't get to express itself in the way that it normally would because your tongue is already getting ready to do the consonant as it's producing the vowel. And you might even be able to feel this if you do it in your own mouth and maybe do it kind of slowly and think about what is my tongue doing? You might be able to feel your tongue moving upwards. If you really slow it down, you can almost hear an I creeping in there, right? Put. Okay, so we've talked about this before, right? The difference between sensation and perception. Sensation being what our senses record and perception being what we experience or what we understand. So we sense the physical properties of sound, but we're perceiving the event that caused those physical properties. This might be a little bit weird to think about it this way, but that is ultimately the purpose of our senses. We're trying to reconstruct events in the world given the information that from our senses. So we're not just interested in like, oh, what does the airstream feel like, right? What are those bursts and whatever? That's not so important. My brain doesn't really care about the quality of air pressure. I care about what was going on with the person who generated those bursts and that air pressure. I wanna know why they did that. I wanna reconstruct their thoughts. So the target of speech perception here, it's not the sounds themselves, it's those mental categories, those mental representations, because that's what's going to allow me to figure out what word the person was saying. That's why we have so many of these processes to reconstruct what that underlying reality of the sound was, even though it has come out kind of distorted in certain ways. Because I don't really care about the physical reality of the sound. I'm only using that as a means to an end to figure out what the speaker intended. So we've talked about how we have context from one sound to the next sound, co-articulation the effect of the immediate context, immediately neighboring sounds. But let's go up a level in context and talk about the lexical effect. There's an interesting study done by William Ganong where he found we have a bias to interpret sounds in such a way that what we're hearing will form a recognizable word. So what he did is he would present words with an ambiguous sound. Remember that we can sort of sample from that continuum between D and T. And in the middle of that continuum, the sounds are a little bit ambiguous. It's not really clear whether it's a D or a T. So he would use those ambiguous sounds and construct words like dash. But of course, with that ambiguous initial sound. So when you hear this word, you're thinking, wait, did I hear dash or did I hear tash? It's a little bit ambiguous. It could have been either one. Well, dash makes more sense, right? Like tash isn't really a word. So probably I heard dash. So what Kanong found was that there's a very strong bias on our perception of these sounds. And the bias is such that we want to interpret the sounds so that it makes a real word. So if we hear something like dash or tash with that ambiguous sound, we're more likely to hear dash than tash. And the reverse would be true for a word pair like duft versus tuft. We'd be more likely to hear that as tuft rather than duft, which isn't really a word. So what's interesting about this effect is it's sort of after the fact. It's like a post hoc correction of what you already heard. The ambiguous sound is at the beginning of the word but it's not until you've heard the entire word that you can decide whether that ambiguous sound should have the identity of a D or a T.
You don't know whether it should be a D or a T until after you realize whether it makes a word or not. So only after you've heard the word, then you go back into your mental representation and say, oh, okay, I know what this is now. It's not actually a T, it's a D. It's kind of interesting. It's like your brain going back in time to revise something. We can go up another level. We can see that there's an effect of sentence context too. There's an effect called the phoneme restoration effect where we can use semantic and syntactic information to fill in missing phonetic information. So I'm going to play a sentence right now. I just want you to listen and tell me if you hear anything strange. The state governors met with their respective legislatures <coughs> convening in the capital city. Did you notice anything unusual? You probably heard a cough, right? There was a, clearly a cough in the middle of that sentence. Um, but what else? Was there anything else that was weird or uh, anything that you noticed? Okay, well, I'm going to play that same sentence again, but this time without the cough. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. That's pretty weird, right? It definitely is very noticeable now that there's a missing S. So that cough wasn't just layered on top of this sentence. It was actually completely replacing a missing sound. Why didn't we notice that when the cough was there? Well, the reason we don't notice it is because our brains are actually really, really good at filling in missing information when it thinks that it has a good reason to do so. When you hear the sentence with the S completely missing and nothing masking it, uh, it's really obvious that there's something missing. Your brain knows that. But when there's a cough layered on top, well, now there's a sort of plausible story your brain can tell itself and say, well, I didn't hear an S. That's a little bit weird. I should have heard an S. I know what, what that sentence was supposed to sound like. So there should have been an S there. The fact that I didn't hear an S is a bit unusual, but oh, wait, actually there was a cough at that exact moment. So your brain might tell itself, whoa, okay, that's probably why I didn't hear an S, huh? Well, given that that's probably the case, I'll just fill it back in. You won't even notice. Don't worry. You know, your brain's doing all this stuff behind the scenes, trying to make your life a more pleasant uh, experience, trying to give you a sort of seamless experience of the outside world. And so even though there was an S missing, your brain thought, well, I think I know why it sounds that way, so I'm just going to go ahead and fix this so that you don't have to bother with it. All right, so this has been fun, but I want to talk about one more type of context. It's a little bit different than the others. I'm going to cycle back around to visual perception. So there's one more type of context that really matters for speech perception, and that is visual input. Sounds a bit weird, right? Speech is auditory. We experience it through our ears. So why should vision matter? Well, it turns out that what we see has a really big effect on what we hear. Ba, ba, ba. Have a look at this. What do you hear? Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. But look what happens when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, and yet, ba, the sound ba, hasn't changed. In ba, every clip, ba, you are only ba, ever hearing ba, ba with a B. Ba, 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 it's an illusion ba, known as the McGurk ba, effect. Ba, Take another ba, look. Ba, ba, Concentrate first ba, on the right of the screen. Ba, ba, now to the left ba, of the screen. Ba, the illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. So that's pretty wacky, right? Even though you're hearing ba, if you see the lips doing a fa, you hear it as fa. Pretty wild. It's almost like your brain cares more about what it's seeing than what it's hearing. So that's a bit weird. Well, we can also see the effects of that visual auditory mismatch by measuring brain responses directly. And the crazy thing is that the brain response looks like 
the response that we would get to the sound that we think we heard and not the sound that we actually heard. So that audio-visual integration seems to be happening on a very deep cognitive level. It's really pervasive. It's very hard to switch off. I still get the McGurk effect and I know all about it and I've been studying it for a long time and I've been exposed to it so many times and I still get McGurked every time. As long as I'm looking at the images, I get McGurked. Okay, one more wacky one. So it turns out the sounds that we're hearing, it's not only affected by visual input, can also be affected by our sense of touch. So this is a really wacky study that I love. This is a study by Carol Fowler, where she wanted to test the influence of touch on auditory perception. And the way she did this was by having participants touch another person's lips while they were hearing sounds. So they might hear something like ga, but their fingers would feel a pair of lips going through the motions of ba. And that was enough to fundamentally change what they thought they were hearing. These participants had never done this before, right? They weren't trained to translate touch into particular speech sounds. So even though they had no prior experience uh, interpreting those motor movements through touch, their brains not only interpreted that tactile information correctly, which I think is nuts, but it used that novel information. Remember, information that they've never really been exposed to before. I've never put my hands on another person's mouth to figure out what they're saying before. But your brain is already using that novel information to help determine the identity of the sounds that it's hearing. And it's even giving precedence to that information. You're hearing a, the sound ga, and you're getting misled by the fact that your hand is feeling someone's lips do ba? I mean, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> I, I always laugh thinking about this, thinking like, why would my brain care about that kind of input? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to listen to sounds. Why do I care what my fingers are doing? But your brain is using all of these different kinds of information and it's giving them specific weights. It's a little bit surprising that it's giving so much weight to all of these non-auditory sources of information. So of course, we're doing a lot of bottom-up processing, trying to take information from the outside world and turn it into something meaningful. But we're also doing a lot of top-down processing, right? We're using everything we know about the world and all of our expectations to try to fill in gaps and smooth out noise and harmonize conflicting streams of information. So it makes sense that what we perceive when we hear speech should be affected by so much. When we hear a sound, our perception of that sound is influenced by the presence of nearby sounds, by the identity of the word we think we're hearing, by the meaning of the surrounding sentence. Uh, it's even influenced by information from other senses, not just hearing, but vision and even touch. This is just our brain's way of making sense of what I think is just an ocean of noise, a tremendous wall of information that we're exposed to at all times. And from that ocean of noise, it's trying to stitch together something meaningful. It's trying to build a reconstruction of another person's thoughts transmitted across space and through time as a stream of sound. Okay, let's go over some key concepts from this lecture. We talked about physical versus mental descriptions of speech sounds, right? Those phones, the real in the wild sounds we can describe in terms of like the compression of airwaves versus the phoneme, the mental category, the thing that's useful and meaningful for language. We talked about categorical perception, our ability to parse a continuous spectrum into finite discrete categories. So we're taking something which is analog in physical terms and converting into a representation that is digital. It's discrete, it has categories. We talked about top-down versus bottom-up processing. Bottom-up being taking information from the senses and then building it upwards into some kind of meaningful representation versus top-down taking what we know about the world and what we expect and all of the effects of context, using all that information to try to make sense of what we're experiencing. We talked about some specific influences of context, right? The lexical context, the sentence context, the context of other nearby sounds, and some specific effects related to those, right? The phoneme restoration effect, the ability to fill in missing gaps in a sentence based on what we think that sentence should have sounded like. And the McGurk effect, 
When, what do we do when we have conflicting visual and auditory streams? We have to harmonize those conflicting streams of information somehow. And it turns out in a lot of cases, we seem to give a lot of precedence to the visual information. It's not exactly clear why we do that, but it has been well observed and for a very long time. And it's one of those things that's very hard to switch off. It's a very pervasive part of how we experience sound.